Amen. Ezekiel 37, we have the uh, famous vision of dry bones. And it's depicting a message of hopelessness turned into hope. It's depicting a situation in which the people find themselves very discouraged. They're in Babylonian captivity for their sins. And they think it's all over with. They think it is a a total loss. And that is what is depicted in the vision here. And we're going to see that the hope for the people is to hear God's Word and to do God's Word. And when that happens, they will be revived. They will be restored. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me, brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all, and behold, there were very many in in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. Dry, dryness depicting hopelessness. Dry, we understand what it means to be in a drought and how discouraging that can be, especially those who have animals, those who are trying to take care of their livestock, how hopeless a condition that can be when that continues. These bones are dry, they have been dead, the life is gone, without moisture there's no life. You can't have life without water. Verse 3, he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered and said, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, Prophesy to the bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God of the, uh, to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, then you shall know that I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh. Now notice the question is asked, can these bones live? And Ezekiel responds, O Lord Yahweh, you know. The people, and that's what the dry bones represent, the people in captivity were without hope. They were taken into a foreign land. Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple has been destroyed. They are in a hopeless condition. The solution there in verse 4 is prophesy to these bones and say, hear the word of the Lord. What was the hope of the people? To hear what? God's Word. And when you say these things, notice what happens. I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. So they needed to hear the words of the prophets. They needed to hear those words. And those words needed to be be in a heart that was receptive to bring them back to spiritual life to restore them. Then the imagery there is of these bones coming together and all of the flesh and the sinew being brought back to them. They're coming to life. And what caused that was God's Word. God's Word is what caused that revival or that restoration or that resurrection to take place. Surely I will cause them to, uh, life to enter into them, and you shall live. Sinews on you, verse 6. Flesh upon you, cover you with skin. Put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you'll know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. You'll know based upon what has happened. And so this is what Ezekiel did. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, I looked, and the sinews of the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. 
but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to uh, the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, or wind, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Speaking words. God's words. Speaking the word of the Lord. And we have uh, something similar, similar to that as far as what Jesus said in John chapter 5 in the New Testament. John chapter 5, in verse uh, 25, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself. Verse 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in Him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And he's talking here about a spiritual resurrection. They're going to hear my words. Those who hear will live. Then he talks about the physical resurrection that would take place at the end of the world. In verse 28 and 29. God's word brings life. The less of God's word that is spoken, the less life-giving power there is. And that's why we need to get back to book, chapter, and verse preaching in the Lord's church. Because that is what produces life. It produces uh, spiritual resurrection. And in Revelation chapter 20, you have a, a spiritual resurrection being depicted as those uh, saints who had been slaughtered uh, because of the Roman Empire, because of the persecution. There is a resurrection that takes place, so to speak. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. So here you have resurrection. They had a, a foe, the Roman Empire. It was trying to wipe out the church, persecuted the church. But we know that the Roman Empire was ultimately de defeated and the cause of Christ was resurrected. The church is still here. The Roman Empire has fallen. It fell in 476 A.D. The church is still here. And so, as some preachers say, and I've heard Johnny Ramsey say, truth crushed to earth will rise again. Resurrection. God's Word. That's why we are told to preach the Word. Preach God's will. And when you have less and less of that, you have less and less of God's power being put forth. Because the gospel is God's power into salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And so here we have prophecy, God's word, God's power to, to bring about a revival within a, a, a nation of dry bones. And so we know that the hope of a people is to preach prophesy. Of course, we don't have inspired preaching today, which is prophecy. But the preaching of God's Word, that is what will revive any Christian, any group of Christians, and the need of any nation to get back on track. And we talk about the need of our nation and all, all of the politicians getting together and uh, they looking at the problems and the issues at hand. I'm so glad to hear a, a lot of them talking about being pro-life, getting back to the sanctity of life in the womb. That's a message from the Bible, that life is sacred. Getting back to the concept of marriage supposed to be between a man and a woman. That's a, a given in the Bible. 
And therefore, uh, we see here that uh, getting back to God's will on any subject will cause a revival and will cause uh, God's people to uh, wake up and be resurrected from their dry, hopeless condition. Any questions or comments about this before we go further? Who was prophesying with Ezekiel during this time? Daniel. Daniel, he was in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar while Ezekiel was with the people in captivity. So you had... uh, Prophets that oftentimes overlapped one another, and uh, they they would be in two different places prophesying God's will to the people. Now look at verse eleven, Ezekiel thirty-seven and verse eleven. Then he said to me, "Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off." Now, whose fault is it that they got into that situation? Theirs. If they had listened to the prophets earlier, generations before, they would not be in this condition. So they ignored prophecy before and got themselves in this condition of captivity. Verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. That's the people going back to the land after 70 years of captivity. They're going to go back, a remnant will go back to the the land. They'll rebuild Jerusalem, the walls, and rebuild the temple. Ezra and Nehemiah, you see that happening. Those books talk about that. Verse 13, Then you will know that I am Yahweh, When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord, or says Yahweh. Notice the putting of the spirit in them is in connection with the word being preached. The message being preached. You don't have the Spirit if you don't have the words of the Spirit. And that's why we have to understand that having the Holy Spirit means we have His words, and having His words mean we have the Holy Spirit. They go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin. And so the people are to give credit to God. Yes, they are to make the journey back to the land, they're to, they're to have an obedient faith, they're to be active in what they're doing, travel back, they're to be active in building the walls, God didn't build the walls for them, they had to obey, they were to be active in building the temple, God didn't build the temple for them, but after it's said and done, you say God performed this, God gets all the glory, so that's where you see God's grace and mercy coupled together with faith and obedience. They go together. Now, verses 15 through the end of the chapter is very interesting because it depicts what we have in the New Testament church. It's talking about Christ at one point, and it's talking about the New Testament age that we have. But before that, the people had to go back to the land. They had to go back to the land... So the Messiah could be born in Bethlehem. Couldn't be born in Babylon. The prophecy said he would be born in Bethlehem. He had to live among his people there. And then, of course, die on the cross. So there had to be the restoration of the people to go back to the land after the 70 years of captivity. Verse 15. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, As... For you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. 
then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel and his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. So here's two sticks. He's to write two different things on it. One of the sticks is supposed to say uh, for Judah and for the children of Israel and his companions. The other stick, he writes on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. And he's supposed to put those two sticks together in his hand. Uh, This is a visual aid that he was using that God told him to use to depict a coming together. Join them one to another for yourself into one stick and they will become one in your hand. Verse 18, And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, or Lord Yahweh, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write on will be in your hand before their eyes. So this is a visual aid of the people coming together. Now the people who knock on your door, the Mormon elders, who are about 20 to 21 years old, they say the stick of Joseph is the Book of Mormon. And they say Joseph is referring to Joseph Smith. He was born, he lived in the early 1800s. The first stick is the Bible. The second stick of Joseph, that's the Book of Mormon. So you put the Bible together with the Book of Mormon, you have the complete will of God. Now that's what they'll tell you this verse is talking about. Joseph Smith, who is the founder of the Mormon church, who had at least 22 wives, um, a polygamist. We heard about a polygamist, a Mormon offshoot, getting uh, sentenced in the past few weeks. He's uh, just following what the founder of Mormonism is doing, did in the 1800s. And um, they'll try to use the Bible in this passage here to say, you got the Bible, that's good, but you need another testament of Jesus Christ. The ones that the angel Moroni told Joseph Smith that are in upstate New York. He went and he found these golden plates, had them translated, and here's the Book of Mormon. You got the Bible, now you need the Book of Mormon so those two sticks can be joined together. And you can have the complete will of God. And they'll base it on this verse here. How would you respond to that? Right. The old law, old law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 tells us, and we have the new law of Jesus Christ found in the new. Galatians chapter 1 is a good passage to go to. Galatians 1, 6-9, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. There are some of you who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preached any other gospel to you than that which you have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then that which you have received, let him be accursed. Based on that verse right there, based on that verse right there, if there was an angel named Moroni that appeared to Joseph Smith in the early 1800s, Joseph Smith should have ignored him. He should have ignored him based on this passage. 
But that, that's a good uh, passage to go to. And, they, and, what, and their response to that is, we're not preaching another gospel. We, we're giving you the complete revelation of God. You've got the, the, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, and then you have what happened over here in the Americas. Where, uh, what, what, there's something in the text itself of, of, of Ezekiel 37 that really shows what they're saying is false. Where does it say anywhere in the text that they're talking about a book? Ezekiel 37, there's nothing said about a book. Nothing said about a scroll. They're imposing on these passages their message instead of letting the passage say what it says. It's two sticks with two things written on it put together. It's not talking about two books or two scrolls. It's talking about two sticks with things written on it and then later on you read about what he's talking about. He's not talking about the Bible and the Book of Mormon Again, when you read it in its context, not talking about that. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, there, he, he gives an explanation as to that meaning of the sticks being put together. And further on in verse 21 as well. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of the people from among the nations, wherever they, are, they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the Bible and the Book of Mormon. But that's how people will mishandle the Word of God to, to try to get across their false message. And usually, when a false teacher quotes a scripture, if you read the verses before it and after it, in its context, you'll have the answer. You'll almost always have the answer within the context of the verse that they quote. And just because a, a, a preacher or a teacher or someone at your door quotes a lot of Scripture doesn't mean that they're doing it correctly. Peter talks about those who twist the Scriptures. So you can have someone giving a lot of verses, but that doesn't mean they're handling it correctly. You've got to look at it in its context. And so the explanation here shows he's talking about Different groups of people becoming one nation, verse 22, in the land and on the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. This is talking about the people returning. The people will be one nation again, no longer two, remember, after Solomon's death, you had Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Jeroboam to the north, ten northern tribes, and then Rehoboam to the south, the ten southern tribes, divided nation. When they come back, they're going to be one nation. They won't be two. They will not be divided into two nations again. They shall have uh, one king to reign over them. Verse 23 they shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of the transgressions, their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Verse 24, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd... And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to do them. 
What is he talking about that has fulfillment in the New Testament? Christ and the kingdom. What does David have to do with it? Do what now? Lineage. It was promised to David that through his descendants would come the king, Christ. So looking at it from the, from the point of David, he's not talking about literal David. He's talking about the one who would be the descendant of David. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verse 3 talks about uh, Jesus and it says concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead and oftentimes in the gospel accounts Jesus is called the son of David descendant of David David the king shall be over them. He'll be the one king who's reigning over them. And notice during this period of time, when they become one, one nation, they're not going to involve themselves in idolatry. He's going to deliver them. He's going to cleanse them. I shall be their God. They shall be my people. They shall have one shepherd. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Look at verse 15. Look at verse 14, rather. I, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep that I have, which are not of this fold, they also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. One flock, one kingdom, one church. And one shepherd, the king over them. That's Christ. He's described as David here in Ezekiel 37. And so we see here that this is talking about the New Testament period uh, in which we are living because he shall be uh, the God to his people. And we, we see this terminology uh, even in the New Testament as it talks about how that we are to be uh, pure in our life and uh, live uh, for, for God in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, they shall be my people. Same terminology you find here in uh, Ezekiel 37. He's going to cleanse them. He's going to make them one. Going to have one shepherd over them. And so we see here, That when the people come back to the land, that's not the end of the story. The people coming back and rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, that's not the end of the story. Because after that, about a period of 400 years later, Christ will be born. It's not going to happen overnight. But that is an end to uh, the end result of what God is having happen here when they return back to the land. So in verse 24, Ezekiel 37, 
we see here what's being spoken of. The people, the two peoples that have been divided can be one. They can be one in Christ. So whatever division it may be, of course, and this is talking about the division of, of the Israelites, or whether it's talking about the division of Jew and Gentile, we can be one in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about be one, one new man, one body in Christ. Talking about the church. Christ is the king over the kingdom. Singular king, singular kingdom. Be what now? Sounds like a pledge of allegiance. Yes, the unity there. One nation under God. Spiritually speaking, the church is one nation under God. God's nation. Uh, spiritually speaking, in a redemptive sense, under God. Verse 24 of Ezekiel uh, 37 says, They shall have one shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Uh, they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. God's commands, God's will, found in the New Testament, shall be done. Verse 25, Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, their children and their children's children forever. My covenant and my, excuse me, my servant, not covenant, my servant David shall be their prince forever. So the blessings that's going to come upon them from David. Of course, that's talking about Christ, the descendant of David, will reign forever and ever. Verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Here's the covenant, the New Testament. This is the covenant that he will make. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. And we have that new covenant, the New Testament, in our Bibles as the will of God, the complete will of God. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. What is the sanctuary of God on earth today? The church, because it's the temple of God. The sanctuary shall be in their midst forever. What did Daniel say about the church when he referred to it as the kingdom? Daniel 2 and verse 44. It shall never be destroyed. It will stand forever. What did Jesus say about it in Matthew 16 and verse 18? The gates of Hades shall never prevail against it. The church will stand. It might be the vast minority in some places, but it will be forever. John 10 and verse 14. Oop, I'm in the wrong chapter. John 10 and verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. Exactly. He knows who his people really are. And in verse 28, uh, Ezekiel 37 and verse 28, the nations also will know that I, the, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Now we've already established the tabernacle, the sanctuary, I looked at, I skipped verse 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's what we find in the New Testament with the church. The nations, that's talking about all the nations of the world, also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Within the nations, you're going to have the sanctuary of God. And he sanctify Israel. What is the Israel of the New Testament? The church? Where does the Bible say that?
John 1, 14. Talks about the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We shall be held as glory and glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That doesn't say anything about Israel. That's talking about Christ. What is the Israel of God today? And the answer was the church. Where does the New Testament say the church is Israel today? Sir? Right. That's Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and it's referring to those who strive with God. In the New Testament, there are passages that speak of the of Christians being of Israel. Hebrews chapter 8. What verse? And verse 10 talks about they should be, I should be their God, they should be my people. Mm-hmm. I will be their God, they shall be my people. Same, same thought of Ezekiel 37. How about Galatians 6 and verse 16? Galatians 6 and verse 16. Well, actually verse 15 and 16. Galatians 6, verse 15 and 16. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. The new creation is the Israel of God. The new creation is in Christ. The new creation is the church. Therefore, it is the Israel of God. So, Israel is not physical Israel, based upon lineage, physical lineage, but spiritual Israel based upon a spiritual lineage. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, for if you are Ab- excuse me, if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendant and heirs according to the promise made to him. Not physically, spiritually. So we are we are spiritually speaking the children of Abraham, which would be Israel. And as a result of that, um, uh, we are uh, the Israel of God today when uh, we undergo the conversion, which is spoken of as a circumcision. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. When a person believes and is baptized, they undergo a spiritual circumcision made without hands, entering into Israel, the the church. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Spiritual Israel. And when you, we don't have time for this, of course, but when you read Romans 9, 10, 
and 11, those chapters, it contrasts physical Israel with spiritual Israel and, and denotes that Christians are spiritual Israel today. Now, I said all that to get back to the verse here in Ezekiel 37 and verse 28. The nations will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel. The Israel there is talking about the church in the context. When my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Within the nations, you're going to have the sanctuary forever. When people go out and preach the gospel to all nations, making disciples of all nations, and you have congregations in those nations, you have God's sanctuary in those nations, whether it be America, Jamaica, India, Africa, and that's spiritual Israel all over the world. So even in verse 28, you see that this is going to be a worldwide phenomenon. The church is not going to be in one geographic location. The sanctuary of the Lord, the sanctified Israel, the church of the Lord, will be in the nations. Wherever the gospel is preached and people obey, the Lord adds to the church. Next week we will continue our study in the book of Ezekiel. We'll look at some more of these prophecies and these teachings in Ezekiel. And uh, we will continue then, Lord willing.